Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lakshmi's Leadership Lounge. You know, uh, the future of work is changing. And now, more than ever, is the time we evaluate the way we lead to prepare ourselves for it. That's why we bring you a series that showcases a plethora of leaders who have inspired us by redefining the way they lead. So join me, Lakshmi Prathuri, on this journey as I take a deep dive into the lives of these trailblazers and their unique take on leadership. And today we have with us Swapnil Jain. Uh, you know, I always joke that uh, uh, half as, uh, you know, people who are the new generation, people who probably weren't even born when I went to high school or college, really are the ones that are gonna redefine the way we live. Not just uh, little by little, but in a huge way. And Swapnil is an example of that. He's an um, engineering design graduate from IIT Madras. Uh, along with Tarun Mehta, he conceptualized Aether Energy with the belief in an electric and a connected future. And we'll talk more about what it means. Aether Energy has built an entire EV ecosystem in India with a scooter, as well as public charging infrastructure, just to make sure the solution is complete. He's really an ardent believer in the power of technology. He believes that the best innovation happens when multiple technologies work together. That's why you notice design as well as engineering. Uh, intelligent electric vehicles for him exhibit the synergy between software, mechanical, electronics, and algorithms. So this makes the industry the best playground for innovation with huge potential for market disruption. At Aether, Swapnil works on both long-term technology roadmap, as well as day-to-day -day aspects of creating a top-notch engineering team and culture. He is a product person at heart. With that, I would like to welcome Swapnil Jain. Hi, Swapnil. Hi. Hi. So, so good to uh, have you on our show. And, uh, you know, I always say that uh, uh, I learn the most from our next generation. So you have a lot to teach me today on all the things that you're doing and all the things that you think I should expect in the future. So I'd love to start with uh, knowing what are the earlier influences on your own life uh, that evoked your interest in electric vehicles and uh, and also you talk about multiple disciplines. It's not just one, but that holistic approach and uh, electric vehicles, where did it all start? Right, uh, and first of all, thanks for uh, having me on the show. I'm, I would really, uh, really say I'm honored to be here. Um, come, uh, on how the whole thing on electric vehicles started, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex uh, journey. I would say um, uh, starting from my discipline, at uh, at my at my college, where the focus has had always been on building products, which means building something which is uh, and when you say a product, you cannot talk about mechanical engineering or you cannot talk about software engineering. A product is a is a whole, right? Like and, and there are multiple things starting from engineering to manufacturing to uh, to to actually making a business case to be able to sell it. So it's it's. And, and, and my general interest has always been in things which seem more complicated. And I think uh, when, when, you, when you want to, when you look at something which is, uh, when you want to optimize for multiple things together, th that's when the problem actually becomes a lot more uh, complex and a lot more interesting to solve. If you're only trying to make the best engineering product without worrying about the cost or without worrying about the uh, manufacturability, then it's, it's a lot easier. It, it, there's no really real fun in, in, in doing that. But when you have more constraint, uh, like I typically like to think that a good engineer always loves a constraint because that's what brings the, the best out of uh, out of an engineer, or or that's when the best innovation uh, really happens. So uh, and we we were sort of encouraged to build a lot of physical products uh, while we were in in our college, and and that sort of uh, uh, it, it was sort of uh, uh, always very fulfilling experience to build something which which really works and. And, and it, 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 it's like a, a creation of your own. 
like writing equations and and things is not as fulfilling than actually creating something physical in front of you whom you yeah. can like really show to someone and say okay this is this is what i i created um that was the uh, real yes, uh, early early experience and then sort of uh, uh, building on top of it we we got exposure uh, to more more things like mechanical electronics software and and it was it, again a, a new uh, revelation was that when you really uh, like the the entire uh, sort of uh, um, the way the whole uh, engineering has has evolved is that earlier our products were, were purely mechanical and then they started mm-hmm. having some amount of electronics and then then it became better and they started having a lot of electronics then they became even better and then they started having a lot of software then and they became even better and now they have uh, uh, like artificial intelligence uh, sitting on top of it and and and, and it, it it's been a, in a journey and uh, a new age product cannot be imagined as as only mechanical or only software or only uh, electronics mm-hmm. all the new age products will have element of all of the disciplines uh, together and a good product will only uh, be successful and the, the best product will come out when you have synergies between all these disciplines um, to to deliver a great experience mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that that was the the thought for me why why it's important to have this synergy yeah no i think it's great i think when you're going to college you're exposed to multiple things and you start seeing how they all fit in together and now you're trying to create a product uh, finally the time has come when they are all at equal level of maturity that you can put them all together right. and uh, and you've taken the path of electric cars electric vehicle i mean electric vehicles um etc and uh, you know as you know electric cars or uh you know there are people talking about trucks and all those things they have a very different environmental impact compared to you know in- internal combustion engines right and there are many countries that are taking a goal saying by x date we got to completely um uh, you know replace ics and stuff like that now can you highlight a little bit of these impacts I and mean, what does it mean for something electric to completely replace an internal combustible engine right um in a, in, a, in a country like india where uh, where firstly the uh, mo- major of the commute happens on on two wheeler uh, mm-hmm. it uh, almost more than 60% of the personal uh, personal commute happens on a on a two wheeler so uh, so unlike all the all the other countries it was it is very important to look at uh, uh, look at two wheelers when you're talking about india and and, and it's it's pretty evident even from the the policies which are which are coming out that uh, uh, two wheelers are are more important for for a country like india than than a than a four wheeler or, or or even a truck um uh, 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 the mode of uh, the mode of energy which we consume has a lot of lot of play not just on the environment but also on the on the economics of uh, uh, of, of things uh, and, and even even geopolitical situations so uh, the move from uh, a, a petrol driven uh, or a fossil fuel driven vehicle to electric vehicle uh, is, is something really important for a country like india which has which does not have a huge reserves of uh, of, of fossil fuel um, mm-hmm. plus uh, 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 being a large population which which we are uh, e- even though the, the carbon footprint of of an individual will be small but just a, just a sheer fact that the, the number of people uh, are, are 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 quite huge uh it, it creates a very very bad uh, situation in the cities like delhi uh, even in bangalore uh, being in, in one of the world's most uh, uh, polluted uh, uh, countries uh, cities so uh, and and hence it is it is really important that we take the major portion of our commute and convert them to electricity uh, or, or electric mode of transport both from a uh, uh, from the from the economy perspective from a geopolitical perspective as well as uh, from a uh, from an environment uh, perspective um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's it's really important that we start controlling uh, those aspects and um, you know it's interesting you set out to build a product first it was not that i want to solve the sustainability problem of the world and what can we do you just said i want to build a great uh, you know uh, product first and now you're actually seeing the impact it could have on sustainability and you're actually one of the few companies that is looking at this studies and saying what impact it could have etc so tell me a little bit about how do you now embed sustainability in all that you are doing 
um, while you also look at the product focus and get great product out. Right. So uh, for us, the thought process was was, was pretty clear that uh, um, even though sustainability is is important, uh, people won't buy a product just because it is sustainable. There will be a small uh, small population which would do that. But uh, for most people, they want the comfort, right? Like you cannot take away the fact that people want uh, comfort, uh, and and you hence have to develop products which delivers uh, the the comfort or the use case in a in a sustainable manner. That's the only way to do it. So irrespective of whether you're de- developing a sustainable product or not, you cannot take away the aspect of uh, uh, great product uh, from uh, from what you are developing. So everything which we develop at Ather. we are we are very clear that first it has to be a, a, a great product because even if it is slightly low on sustainability uh, a great product will at least make it happen people will at least start the movement towards uh, electric vehicle and that's what is important so and that's why we started with a with a with a vehicle in a in a premium segment because we wanted to offer the experience to customers which they cannot get on a uh, on a ic engine uh, all the ic engine vehicles were were pretty much uh, similar uh, they did not have any uh, smart functions uh, on it they did not have on board navigation we said that's the that's the first thing we have to uh, target because people will not buy an electric vehicle just because it is electric people will buy electric vehicle because it gives them a better experience than their uh, than their uh, current set of vehicles and that's yeah. when we started the, the, the strategy that will build a build a premium vehicle which gives them the best in class two wheeler the, the product which we launch in the field has to be the best the best two wheeler and and uh, hence it has the best acceleration it has the best features uh, and then you take that and, and and sort of get people motivated enough get them overcome the fear of electric vehicles and then you sort of start launching products uh, once people are comfortable with the idea of uh, uh, electric vehicles because early on you need that push uh, for people to first start converting uh, into a uh, uh, into buying an electric vehicle uh, And and once once you sort of exceed it with the uh, early uh, uh, early adopters, then we, we start targeting the uh, the the sort of majority yeah. of the uh, of the of the population. So, yeah, and uh, I didn't want to. Sorry, I just wanted to say one thing that I really yeah. like the way I didn't want to lose uh, uh, highlighting that is that I like the way that you're saying is that give the person smartness. you know that an electric can bring in a scooter because people only think of giving the smart in a electric car or a, a truck or a something or the something but to say that this is what most people drive and let's give some smartness in it so maybe can you expand a little bit on what are the two three things you gave that made it smart that made someone say this is what i want right So uh, and this problem is I think very unique to India because as I said the sixty percent of the personal commute happens in on on the two wheeler uh, something like navigation right like it's it's very common in four wheeler to have navigation uh, but two wheelers none of the two wheelers have a good navigation experience only few of them are having right now but even that is not the the greatest uh, experience and the funny thing is uh, the navigation is lot more critical in a uh, in a two wheeler than a than a four wheeler. because on four wheeler you could just take your mobile phone and just put it on the windscreen and and, and it and it works but you can't do that on a two wheeler it's it's all exposed you cannot put a mobile phone on there um, and and you have to stop at every every few uh, uh, like kilometers you will have to stop and and bring your phone out of your pocket and see where do i have to go and then then navigate it's very difficult to navigate on a on a two wheeler but no one was solving that that problem so um, that was the first problem we attacked we said that we are going to provide A, a very good navigation experience, very uh, detailed navigation experience on a two wheeler, and we are the first to do that. And even today, we are the only ones who have a very uh, detailed uh, navigation uh, route uh, uh, on the on the vehicle itself. Um, mm-hmm. Then we then we introduced uh, uh, and, and to make this navigation happen, we introduced a, a seven seven inch like a uh, uh, display, which is again not very common in a uh, uh, in a uh, two wheeler. Uh, you, you primarily see. analog displays or or maybe some sort of a seven segment display but you don't see a tft screen on a on a two wheeler with a touch screen right like so to make navigation even better we we added a touch screen uh, onto it mm-hmm. um along with that we started adding more algorithms on the vehicle which a lot of times customer does not really see 
but solves the problem which are there with electric vehicles what happens when the temperature goes up how do you give a smooth uh, experience so that uh, the customer doesn't accidentally end up overheating the battery and then getting stranded uh, somewhere so uh, like gracefully managing temperatures which which is a big problem in in a country like uh, india where the temperatures are typically are much much higher side so um, managing uh, managing uh, temperatures managing thermals uh, allowing navig uh, allowing uh, uh, to be able to uh, sort of interact with your vehicle through a mobile phone so now you you uh, how you, your every day every ride is sort of uh, uh, you you can see it on your phone as a as a, as a ride ride stat right. so you can understand what is your riding pattern that helps in you sort of taking care of range anxiety because once you yeah. know how your riding pattern is affecting your range uh, mm -hmm. and, and you can sort of keep a track of of how it has been happening you can actually overcome your range anxiety because you can start controlling your ride, uh, ride pattern and and mm -hmm. and get more range out of the uh, the same uh, vehicle without compromising on your uh, mm -hmm. uh, riding experience so this sort of a so, feedback to the customers really help yeah and so swapnil you would start with building a great product you know the electric scooter and you added all these features that made it a great product and you've had the marketing you guys have been out in the market uh, quite a bit so what are some of the challenges that you faced as a leader along the way and what are the uh, you know a few lessons you learned out of those challenges right uh, i think uh, uh, one of the big lesson uh, for us was that uh, um, like uh, like you uh, you have to uh, I, 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 what what i actually love the most like you have to look at the entire picture you cannot look at only uh, design as an as an engineer and, and if you are especially a product person you you focus a lot on on design uh, and and you want to create the best product out there but a best product is not a best product if it cannot be manufactured Uh, as as well uh, it cannot be serviced as as well if it if it is prone to uh, defects because of the uh, uh, because of the that the manufacturing techniques involved in creating that product is is, is not very uh, uh, conducive to a mass manufacturing setup so our, our designs uh, in in the early days were were purely from an engineering perspective but over time we learned that you have to take care of a lot of things like manufacturability supply chain uh, uh serviceability to build a, a great product so uh, and and over emphasizing on only the the specifications of the product or or the, the product features uh, could be detrimental uh, to the growth of the uh, organization so one mm -hmm. of the biggest lesson we have learned is that how to balance between feature cost timelines uh, reliability all and of that uh, put yeah. together yeah right it's 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 a yeah. uh, i think that uh, and especially it's very very important for a for a hardware company because uh, in software you can iterate really fast you you right. create a product it doesn't work out next day you uh, create a new set of code but problem with hardware is that everything is fixed uh, once you create a design you cannot change it for for at least a year because of the huge investment which mm -hmm. goes in, in actually creating a design uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 for a hardware company it's, it's a lot more essential to understand these these aspects um than than what a software company would need and i think this this has been our biggest learning uh, in the last uh, four or five years so do you have a favorite mantra or do you have a leader you look up to when you're uh, you know as part of building the company do you have like a favorite quote or a favorite mantra or a favorite person you know someone you admire right uh, uh no I, i don't know if it's a mantra or not but but i really like to uh, create small like my 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 focus always is create small decoupled set of people uh, who can work independently so i, I, I and, and that is applicable to engineering as well as to uh, 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 people so even when you're creating a design you should create uh, uh, the, the design which you create if even if you are creating a scooter create design such that uh, they are very decoupled from each other uh so that uh, if if let's say um uh you change one part that does not now need you to change every other part uh, on the on the vehicle and it's a, it's a very uh, important thing again in a in a hardware perspective because the, the entire vehicle is a very complex uh, piece and it has more than 350 parts which are which are there and if every single part is intertwined with with each other uh, then then it becomes very difficult to do anything because every time you touch something 350 other things have to be uh, touched 
so it really slows the way you can uh, way you can work and it also takes away uh, it it also sort of uh, uh, breeds lot of uh, bureaucracy hierarchy uh, into the uh, into the system so how you design your uh, how you define your engineering or architecture of engineering affects how people work with with each other uh, and and again people work really great when they are uh, independent set of uh, small individual groups who can work almost independent to each other without needing too much of uh, uh, reliance on on each other so mm. uh, marrying this world of uh, engineering or, or like product to how people work uh, and and keeping very very small nimble groups which can work really fast towards a product development i think that that's that's been always my focus on on any kind of uh, either product design or team design or whatever we do at at either yeah no i think that's really great i think there are a couple of really big takeaways from me in this in terms of first focus on the product you know when you get it right then you can balance it with all the impact you can have and the sustainability you can create etc so that's the first thing and the second thing is what you just said in terms of uh, it's sort of together together but separate you know or separate but together right. kind of teams so that uh, people have a sense of independence but at the same time it fits into the overall uh, thing also So now we come to that part uh, of the interview. Stump me if you can, where you get to ask me any questions that you want. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think I had, I had quite a few questions, especially because you have been interacting with uh, with a uh, uh, lot of uh, lot of leaders uh, across the across different domains, across different age groups, gender, uh, uh, whatnot. So I think uh, probably I, I thought this is uh, uh, this is something which you could. Uh, uh shed some light on how do you think uh, the the leadership is is being changing over the uh, over the decade uh, the the leaders who were there uh, like what was the leadership style uh, let's say about a decade ago and and how is it looking like now and, and what do you think uh, is going to be the future of of this yeah i think uh, you know during the industrial age and even when i worked you know when i worked at intel or whatever you know we have learned we have grown up to learn to admire a leader who knew everything who had all the answers who was smarter than you um etc and we always um try to be those kinds of leaders where it's a more a very paternalistic uh, way a patriarchal way of being where i am the protector i want to make sure my whole team is taken care of i i should have all the answers etc and i think because there was very few people who knew everything because as you were saying sometimes when you do separate but together the things could be so separate that there's only few people who have the holistic picture you know right. and so that was the way of management especially in the world of industry and hardware and manufacturing and all those kinds of things and what i have learned uh, over the years it has changed so dramatically in fact it's just the opposite now if you try to have all the answers you you're bound to fail because you need to hire people who know a lot more than you you need to learn from them and you need to surround yourself with people uh who who are very different than you there's no one person who has all the answers so i think we have moved from an expert to a council of elders you know like it's sort of we moved in leadership style when i say elders it's not age but in terms of thought process you know so that's the biggest change that i see is that um just by age or number of years of experience or whatever no one person knows more than the other because experience mattered before because it, the same problems were occurring over and over again because the product was the same right. now the product is different the circumstance is different i can in fact if i say that hey we tried this 5 years ago it did not work let's not do this i'll be doing a disservice to the company because the circumstances right. may have completely changed so i think that's the biggest change i see as a leader you have to be a lot more embracing of diversity and talent i mean you have to hire people smarter than you uh, it there was always the case but now it's a matter of survival No. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lakshmi. I think uh, that's 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 really really 
uh, important yeah and, and especially the fact that circumstances are changing and and uh, uh, and the things change so fast that what was relevant 5 years ago is probably no more uh, no longer relevant I mean, and and 3 years yeah. ago i mean i think of 2019 to now and i feel the world has completely changed you know i cannot right. hold anything true today that was true in 2019 right. so Right, yeah, right. yeah. I'm like you probably le- learn more from younger folks than from older folks uh, uh, with the with the changing it, scenario. It's both, you know. Actually, I wanted to say that the real, um, uh, you, you know, thing, real success is when you have a balance because experience has a place in being a coach, and the right. youth or a new idea has a place in its tenacity. And I think we make a mistake sometimes of. ageism also is there right you kind of say oh you're over right. 30 you know clue what's going on you know but i think when everybody works together uh, it's really really very powerful i think when a young team says okay i'm going to have a board of advisors who are very experienced in different fields i think that's the best combination actually yeah right right uh, uh probably something which uh, is it's like a follow up to because we have been talking a lot about ageism and, and youth yeah. uh now how do you see uh, like let's say there are quite a few young founders uh, uh, sitting in in probably the, the top most position across uh, like ether mm-hmm. is one example but mo- a lot of the startup which you see they have quite young founders and and, and are sitting on the on the top most position mm-hmm. how, how do you see the 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 relation between probably a, an older uh, senior management and a and a young founders how how does that play out in your experience i think it is important for all of them to work together i think they both need to have a very health, healthy attitude about the other because you know there's a lot of things we can do for check marks you know to say that okay i also have this i also have this kind of a thing but it shows whether you truly believe in it or not so i think it is very important for young founders to understand that while their technology and knowledge may be better but the way how you handle uh, your customers maybe how you handle your co-founders how you handle your employees right. there's a lot you can learn from someone who has experience and similarly somebody who has the experience shouldn't get bogged down by why am i reporting to somebody half my age or you know stuff like that and say that can we create a healthy environment can i be a coach instead of a player you know can i hmm. be uh, uh, you know the sounding board so i really say you know one of the programs actually i think we created is called think future makers because my thinking is that we need a platform where the young and the old and the men and the women and the different geographies everybody comes together to learn from each other i think it's extremely right. important for young founders to find uh, someone they respect and for experienced people to surround themselves with young founders right uh, and i always say that especially to people like you to young founders have a personal board of directors i think it's extremely important you need to have two or three people who are your personal board of directors who are making sure you're healthy in every mm-hmm. possible way when you're frustrated about something they can be there for you so i think for all of us especially for young founders having a personal board of directors is extremely important all right like quite an quite an interesting mm-hmm. thought like never never thought about it this way yes as founders i think uh, there is there is always uh, days when you are really frustrated and 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 you need some yeah. sort of a sounding board and yeah, yeah i think yeah. that that's that's really interesting and the last thing, probably... and the last thing i will say is that as a as an entrepreneur especially you eat breathe sleep your company right you have no right. time to think of anything else and it's right. extremely important to set aside at least 20% of your time for doing something other than work because that's mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. great ideas come from and even some of the greatest mm-hmm. leaders you know say this in retrospect that we spend way too much time looking at the product we should have looked forward we should have surrounded ourselves with right. different people so i think it's the more busy you are the more important it is to carve out at least 20% of your time 
to do something that has nothing to do with work, be it you go for a run or you attend a music concert or, you know, play music. It doesn't matter what. Something that is not work, you know. The more pressure there is on you, the more you need to do that because that's when new ideas right. come from. So anyway, right. uh, so I think we need to move to the last segment, which is my favorite <laughs> thing is that I always love, uh, you know, Sapnil, it's been so amazing talking to you. This is what gives me energy. You have ether energy. I have like people energy, you know. So <laughs> uh, this is what excites me is, uh, you know, to see people like you uh, do well. So what, in a very greedy way, we have something called Ink Tree Seed, where we say that um, we don't want to lose touch with you right after this interview, but can we do something together uh, after this? Uh, that can, uh, you know, teach us both a little bit more about each other. So uh, one thing I've been thinking about as you were talking is that you know so much about sustainability and you have such a different take on it in terms of get the product right first, think of the economics and then sustainability is a result, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, do you think is it possible for us to, create a session, create something where we can bring very, very different people, say an economist and a behavioral scientist and a energy person and a product person, you know, together to say what is really the future of uh, transportation or future of energy? Uh, what do you think? What are the, if, what if, what sort of things excite you where we can create something like that together? Quite what an interesting idea. I'm like I'm, I'm as I, as you're speaking, it seemed quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, interesting and and, and relevant. Uh, energy is, is a uh, more than sustainability. Energy itself is a, is a very interesting topic uh, uh, for us. Uh, we speak about a lot. Uh, like even when we are not building uh, vehicles, we are, we are talking about uh, about energy and and how it it is something which is uh, which is so relevant in in every single thing we do, every single product we buy, every single service you use, your internet, your uh, like heating, cooling, everything, everything, uh, uh, like humanity is, is very, very dependent on uh, on, on energy. And it, it uh, and, and the transition from a fossil fuel-based economy to a uh, renewable-based economy is going to be very different. We, we only think about uh, yeah. this transition as something which is important for uh, climate, but it's, uh, but it's going to have a very different uh, kind of take on, on economy itself. Things which, which yes. seemed like a, uh, undoable earlier, we could uh, with, the, with the move to a renewable economy, it will suddenly become very much relevant. So I think there's a, there's a big uh, uh, big aspect to be to be discussed uh, on how the entire worldview will change when we move from a fossil fuel based economy to a uh, renewable energy based economy. Yeah, I think that would so be something I would really that. love to we'll, talk about. We'll work together to see who are the Definitely. people we need to bring together to have a really insightful conversation and do that together, okay? Definitely, really interesting. Thank you so much for your time, Swapnila. I always say that uh, the most expensive thing you can give someone is your time. And I think uh, most valuable thing uh, you can give is time. And thank you so much for giving your time. And I love talking to you and I look forward to continuing your conversation. Um, and I really want to thank our audience for taking the time to listen to this. and please feel free to comment and give us your ideas. And as we design this session, what do you think we should do? And thank you so much for your time, uh, Swapnil, and we look forward to having all of you join us again next week to continue the series. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil. Thank you, Lakshmi.